Hey, what's good, people? This is episode 95. This is the Option Podcast. That guy over there, that's AJ. That's Adam Johnson. The episode starts right now. How's it? How's it looking out there in Texas? Is it warm? Is it cold? Well, is it's, it humid? It's, it's it's on a little bit on the warm side. So uh, average day out here is about seventy. Or excuse me, ninety-seven. I wish it was mm-hmm. seventy-nine, but uh, yeah. about ninety-seven. So today is a little bit. Uh, we had some. We have we've had some weather. Uh, so it's been a little bit cooler. It's about ninety-two, ninety-three today. Little little uh, little humid though. It's, it's all right though. Cool, man. I gotta tell you something. Like anyone that's ever done a Google search, right? On at just the name Adam Johnson. You Ooh, are, be careful with that. You gotta you be careful the, with that one. I was gonna say, first. you're the only good guy left. Name, uh, you're, there's one good guy, one ad, one good Adam Johnson out of all of them I searched, right? Go ahead. Maybe, I was gonna say, the first one that pops up is that uh, professional soccer player who's a pedophile. Yes. Just yep. throwing it out there. That's not me, but uh, he's he got out of jail too, so. Yeah, yeah, he was found um, there was another Adam Johnson that was found dead. His head, his severed head, was on a park bench. There, the other. Oh, if, you, Ad- if you go, if you go to my, uh, <laughs> what is it? One, 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 it's not, it's not, um, not LinkedIn, but it's uh, what's that other? So, it, yeah. One of those things where it has a little bit of bio of me. It says I died <laughs> in in ninety four, I believe. <laughs> that wasn't from the Allen Allen hit, right? For team from Team Cup volleyball. <laughs> no, I don't. I don't think so. I'm still living from that thing. That thing's nothing. No, nah, come Allen on. Allen, who? Exactly. Actually, you you stood up with your arms folded and said, "Okay, you got me." But you you, I don't know. You, blunt force. I don't think you you care about that stuff. Um, I don't even remember that. Maybe that's yeah. <laughs> maybe that's how hard he did hit it. Who and knows? The, and the other Adam Johnson took a picture of himself trying to take Nancy Pelosi's um. Uh, uh, oh like yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> that's yeah, that's the other one. <laughs> yeah, so, like, some of my buddies posted up on their Facebook pages. They got and then they of course superimposed my my name and or my face in there and said Adam's up to no good. So Jesus Christ. I mean, um, you were like, it wasn't me, guys. <laughs> I mean, cool picture. Whatever. I mean, the yeah, guy I mean, got himself in me. some hot water, but I mean, it was, I mean, he's talk about being in the middle of somewhere where no one wants to be, but yeah. So what, what club are you coaching out there? Uh, the know. Adam Johnson Volleyball Academy. The it's, uh, yeah. it's one of those ego driven clubs, you know, I'm just trying to, just trying to keep my name out there as long as I can. I'm yeah. just kidding. Well, <laughs> Listen, before I got on the podcast, I talked to um, James Barker. That's that's my homie. That's my Republican <laughs> space ranger, but and brother and brother from another mother. Sure. Um, also spoke to Riley Salmon, um, and everybody had some really really nice things to say about you as far as a club coach is, uh, as being a club coach is concerned. There, to me, there are coaches who some of them turn into glorified babysitters, right? They recruit the best players, right? Uh, uh, um, and they sit there and just make sure the teams don't beat themselves. Take a whole bunch of credit for their team, their players being good. I mean, the players were already good before they got there, for Christ's sakes. And then there's players who kind of do more with less, and there's kind of a mixture of both. You get a few good players, and then there's some players you're like, nah, this girl should be in our club. I see stars in my eyes. Um, and you fall into the ladder. How, how, stop me at any point. How, um, you have, you're building yourself a reputation of, of just taking talented players, making them better. And some players at some, some clubs probably don't look at and, and, and just creating good players. The floor is yours. Well, you know, uh, my, my program is pretty small from that standpoint out here in Texas. Yeah, you know, everything's bigger in Texas, of course. Yep. And um, you know, when, when when tryouts come, you know, I'm not always getting the first and second pick of the litter. I'm getting the third, fourth, and fifth pick of the litter. Uh, so I, I actually have to do this thing called coaching. Uh, so <laughs> you know, I coach these guys up. Um, you know, I started it's kind of. I guess it's been about 14 years ago now, um, where. Out here, if you know you didn't make junior nationals after our regional tournament, that was the last chance that you had to get a bid. Your, your season was done, so that was like the first weekend of May. Now, coming from California, I know that you know if you don't make nationals, you either go to 
uh, what used to be um, uh, the volleyball festival. Right. I don't know where that is now, but you know, it was like five or six days of volleyball. So I, I went up there once and that was it. But uh, need, needless to say, when I opened shop, um, a lot of, a lot of, well, not a lot, all the programs kind of converted to what I was doing because the, the, the people running those other programs know who I am. They know what I've done. Um, to give you an example, everybody, all top teams, everybody just practiced twice a week. And like I said, if you didn't make nationals at, at, at the first week of May, you, you, your season was done. I came out, started practicing three days a week, at least. Every one of my teams practiced three days a week. Uh, and if we didn't make nationals, we went to AAU nationals. So we, we our season was extended for another six weeks. And we played in the open division, you know. And, you know, I got heckled around here a lot because my teams, I don't know if you could call them open level teams, but, you know, we finish 35 out of 36 you know, the first year we were one and 11, you know, and, and, and around here, everybody's saying, oh, Adam's just trying to keep his name alive, you know, and, and using the kids as a, you know, bait for sharks and stuff like that. And, and I'm, I'm kind of like, I'm trying to get these guys better. That's all I personally know how to do, play against the best. That's, that's how I get better. That's all I know. So I'm just, you know, kind of teaching them what I know helped me through my career. So, uh, you know, it, it changed immediately. Everybody started, uh, you know, practicing three days a week. Uh, it took a couple years for the, for the programs to really go to, uh, AAU nationals because everybody was USA volleyball. Uh, and if you were frowned upon, if, uh, you went to AAU. So I, I had no problem with that whatsoever. Uh, I've, I've gone to every, every year to AAUs and, and I, I think it's a great tournament. I mean, for me, what would be the purpose of you using someone for shark bait there? I mean, it wouldn't, I mean, why would someone even say that? Would it be for well, fun? Would it be for your ego? Would it be for what the hell, what the hell would someone, what would be the reasoning behind someone saying something like that? Illogical or illogical? There's, well, there's, you know, around here, I'm sure it's like this out in California, everybody's trying to beat everybody down, yep. you know? And so that they can say something like, well, gosh, if you go play with him, he's just going to throw your kids to the sharks and you know you gotta, whatever, whatever they're gonna say and that's kind of and that's kind of where it started and all that kind of stuff so um I, I i just did what i needed to do i and my teams got better you know that that team that went one and eleven the next year they went uh three and nine and then the next year after that they went six and eight you know and, and slowly got better because they understood and they bought into what i was trying to do Right. It's, it's not about the here and now. It's it's where I can get you guys in the next couple of years. So, uh, you know, and and the kids didn't kids didn't mind, but uh, that that's just kind of how it was. And um, you know, anybody's going to say anything they can, you know, to beat you down or try and you know steal players from you or, or, or whatever it might be. There is nothing more liberating, and it, it took me a while to get to this point. And my guess is you you've. Um, for what you're doing, you're already at this point. There's nothing more liberating where your brand like, and your bottom line are completely separated. Like sometimes, I'll give you an example. Like your bottom line is how you make your money, right? The rug under your feet, sure. how you pay your rent, whatever, and this and that. Um, if, if you own or whatever, property tax, we've all lived in California, we all get that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's why people move to Texas, okay? Um, right. I mean, I'm, look, I might move too, man. They say grace and they say ma'am, you know? I, I might do that too. Um, it's my kids, my, I got very lucky with my kids. I'm not mm -hmm. saying that they would have uh, grown mm -hmm. up differently, but uh, of mm -hmm. course there would have been that 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 element out there so it, it all turned out it turned out to be good kids so here's okay so that's my bottom line brand um would be you it would be adam johnson how you built your career as a player your accomplishments there that led that that led you into this transcendence into being a, in, in, into being a, a highly competitive and good coach um and when something that has some something to say about you doesn't affect how you make your money I love that you could care less. <laughs> I love, I love that you could care less. And it's a, look, I'm there. I, I, I could only, I, t I was on the podcast with Riley Salmon, and I said I put myself in a position where 
like my like there's nothing anyone that's gonna do anything to me whether they hurt my brand that's gonna affect my bottom line i'm already good i have a I have a nice place my wife's with you know she's with the capital group so so i mean like even right. if my world went to hell i still i still land okay and sure. it, and it gives you the liberty to 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 say what you want to say it gives you the liberty to be more candid without cons uh or what some people call consequences you know like sure. like well and, yeah. and it's funny you say consequences right because uh in the last i'd say 20 years you know um you know i grew up in a different era than the kids that i'm coaching of course and we we always do drills and i, I don't know anybody that doesn't but for some reason you know if you know you if you guys don't win this drill, you have to run or you have to do jumps or you have to do something. And I noticed this, I don't know, gosh, I want to say probably 10 years ago, uh, you know, a couple, couple years into it. And, and some of the parents are going, why are you punishing our kids? And I'm like, it's not a punishment. It's part of the drill. You know, they, they know, they know what's going on, you know, and they know if they lose, that they're going to have to do something. And if I'm them, I don't want to lose. Uh, I, I give you a perfect example. Um, when I was at SC, uh, we had a drill where if the second team got three free balls down on us in a row, we had to run. So uh, the setter on the other team set the middle three times in a row, and he beat our middle angle every time. So we ran. And then we get back out there, and the setter sets the middle – two more times and beat, beats our middle blocker angle. And I, and I stopped the, I stopped the drill and I go, I, you know, I don't, I want to say who it I was. Run. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to say doing? who it was. I don't want to say who it was, but I was like, he just beat you. This guy just beat you five times in a row on your angle. Do you think he can make an adjustment? So what do you think he did? Of course he jumped way early into the angle. The guy hits the other way and we have to run again. Uh, and so, I mean, you know, those kind of things are frustrating, right? Because I, I feel helpless unless, you know, unless I dig that ball up, but it's not, you know, it, I look at it as, it's just part of the drill and, and, the, and there, there are, it, it, you can call them consequences or, you know, it, whatever you want to call it. It's not a punishment. It's just part of the drill. And, and, and that's the one thing that I have gotten into my kids is that I'm, I'm trying to make you better. And this is how. I believe this is how I know through proven, you know, it's, it's proven that, that it worked. So that, that, that's all I have to say to them. And, they, and they're like, I get it. I think the, the reasoning be, be uh, that, that people are talking about, oh, it's punishment. Why are you punishing your kids? And you're right. It did happen around a decade ago. I was a head coach at City College in like 2008. And I, I just asked, kept asking my kids. I did the miracle thing. If you ever saw that movie Miracle, who are we? And they're like, where, where are the beavers? I'm not good enough. Backline, you know. Who are we? Beavers. I only heard two of you. Backline, you know. And the the AD I, was just like, you know, this is your friendly AD. Just tell me the reasoning behind this. I said because they have to know that they're if if they lose. This th what they're doing now in practice pales into comparison how they would really feel if they lost in a real game. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? It builds competitive nature. It makes you take that extra step because you know looming, looming right behind you. It's called pressure. I don't call it punishment. I call it pressure. And and, well, and, and, and pressure is a add, good thing. Yeah, Adam. And, to add to, and, and to add to that, I always kind of put the onus on them as well, and I say, how can I get you guys to win this drill? Yeah. What what what? what What's going to, what is it going to take for you? Mm -hmm. Now, my wife, bless her soul, mm -hmm. she'll say, well, why don't you give them ice cream or something? You know, if they win, you know, I'm like, uh, because I didn't get ice cream when I won. You know, Screw I just you, got, coach. I like cake. I just, I just was able not to, I, I just, you know, for winning, you got to watch the other team run. Yeah. That, was, that was it, you know? And so I, I, you know, I think each individual um, is kind of, we're definitely put together differently. And, you know, I, I personally love to watch my opponents or, you know, teammates or whoever do extra work, right? Yeah. I, that's just, I, I don't know if it's a guy thing. I, I enjoy it. Well, and, well and, I think, and, it, and I think that's where it took a left turn. There were a couple of studies that came out that I guess were trying to show people how, like, why punishments don't work and this and that. But when someone tells me, studies show, 
I'm very, very skeptical and I'm very, very careful. What study was it? How long was the study? What's the sample size? How many people participated in the study? Was it a 15-man team? No, it was nine. Was it men? No, it was women. Was it a D1 school? No, it was D2. Did you do the study in a month? No, it was two weeks. And I'm like, I'm sorry, studies show what? You know, so I think... I do have to give my due diligence to what studies show and give it give it their attention and, and at the same time see how it affects us. But at the uh, at the end of the day, the scientist, Adam, uh, um, and people will disagree with me, but I, I stick with this. The, the, the scientists are us. We right. we're the ones that that threw shit crap on the wall and see what stuck. You know, what I'm saying find out what works, find out what we did before, why it works and this and that. And our experiment is ever changing now uh, we could talk about biomechanics and why like you know like someone like phil dalhauser or or lion king the you know the goofy foot approach or the lefty approach how it works against everything biomechanically you had a partner jose Leola was a goofy foot and he's one of the best to ever yeah, I, have, I have this conversation yeah. exactly all the time because I, I you know i work with you know I, I have juniors i work with uh you know adults <laughs> ages 22 to 50. And I got, I've got one of these groups right now where six of the guys have goofy foot approaches. Now, I, I, first of all, who am I to say which is what, what's right and what's wrong, right? I can just tell them, hey, this is what I do. Now yeah. I can give you examples of Jose Loyola, Karch Karai, and Phil Delhauser right mm. there that are goofy foot on the beach. Yeah. Dave, Dave's okay. best player, team. So, so, but there are, there are certain ways to make that goofy foot work whereas they were they were you know their their last footstep was too way too far ahead ah so they had you know it took a long time so it limited their range this way yeah exactly they pivot their so, pivot they're pivot footing a goofy foot exactly so if they're if they're if they're going straight up and down huh. which is like what jose and you yeah know, karsh and, and Phil. Dallas, then, then, then then it's fine and uh, i'm not gonna i'm not gonna change everybody's approach just because of that no. Indoors is a different story. Because no, you need the range. I, you you I need to beat just, the two-man block. I and, and try and change. Perfect story. I had a, I had a girl. Uh, she was a freshman on my 15s team. Goofy foot middle, 6'1". Uh, probably could have gone to some pretty decent schools. Uh, went home, to their went to their house, showed them, showed them two hours of film of their daughter. Talked to them for two hours. And I said, this is what you got to do. This is what I did because I was a goofy foot when I, when I first started. And back then... This is the funny part in club. Uh, the coach told me, I'm not going to put you on the court until you fix it. Okay. And, and so I was like, well, I, uh, at, at 13, I've never sat on a bench in any of my sports that I've ever played. So, you know, I'm, I'm going through the motions. I'm doing, you know, I'm going right, left, right, left, right. You know, down the middle school hall, people are looking at me like, what, what are you doing? I'm like, I don't want to sit on the bench. Yeah. Now, if I said that to a kid today, that parent would say, I'm paying my seven thousand, eight thousand dollars. She's gonna play, you know, which is I, I agree. And the coach told me, he goes, I'm just looking at your your end result. You're down the down the road, not the here and now, because I was still hitting well and doing well and all that. Right. Uh, so but I told this one girl, I said, for one minute a day, just one minute a day, just talk to yourself and, and just go right, left, right, left. But just one minute a day. Yeah. Eight teens comes around. She's still doing it. Her parents are all upset. She didn't have scholarship offers. And I'm like, really? Yeah. So, you know, it, it, it's, it's definitely an interesting business. Yeah. Well, it's a quote, mother Teresa, one must participate in <laughs> one, one must participate in one's own salvation. Right. Sure. I mean, the, yeah. the, it's not something you're, you're going to um, learn and improve if you only go to practice. Like you said, you were doing it in, um, in between, you know, in between classes, yeah, in the, right? In the that, that was, people thought I was crazy. Didn't... I'm like, yeah. Maybe I am, but maybe that's yeah. maybe that's what got me to where I am. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's also about measuring the athlete. I was the head coach at Hunter High School in New York, and I had a kid as a sophomore in my middle. And sometimes when these kids are athletic and dynamic, you, good coaches miss it. You're just looking at the, the incredible jump. You're looking at the snap on the wrist, the range, and you're and then somewhere uh, in the beginning of the season, like the whole preseason, you missed it. You're like, how did I miss that? And then you start yelling at your assistant coaches. I'm like, I got, I got three people here. I got team Always managers. The assistants you know, of, of, yeah. <laughs> of, I'm like, dude, I, 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 I'm looking at a, a 16 person roster, man. You know, of course, yeah. I, no. But listen, if we as head coaches, we fall on that sort. I get that. But I, at that time, I was like, you, 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 instead of me. And he changed it 
by the end of the year and then next year came back a goofy foot and i said no 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 come on you're 16 cuz you cuz when you when they're young it's easier to change it when they're young. When you're when like Phil right now, like Lockheed, you know what I mean? Like, no, you know, Lion King, right? Samoy loves, like no one's gonna come along and say you need to change your steps. But, so he comes back and we fix it. And then his senior year, he's a goofy foot again. I said, all right, just forget it. You know, and then he ended up hitting like 468, you know, good good numbers, even for a sure. middle. You know, middle numbers are always gonna be higher end. And um, and I knew he was like hell no I don't want to play college ball you know I mean it was an academic school anyway he 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 went to Lehigh you know Bro, my, yeah, my yeah, setter yeah. my setter went to Yale my oppo and, and libero went to Brown so it was Hunter High School um, not to be confused with Hunter College Hunter High School was like this this hole in the wall academic um, just killer school on 94th and Park. Um, mm-hmm. led the nation in cumulative SAT scores and Ivy League application acceptance. So if nice. some of these kids are like, oh, nah, I, I just want to play now. I'm like, all right, let's do it, you know? But hey, 38-1 record, man. Good team. 38-1 Not record. PSAL, PSAL champs. Um, Madison Square Garden. MSG gave me coach of the year for that. That was in 2014. So um, cool. that was my only high school gig. I, I've, I've just been club, college, and, and some pros. So you, you played at USC. You were talking about USC. You had, a, you had a pretty three really good years, man. Three, we had four. You, well, yeah. Oh, that fourth year you won, right? No, we, no, no, no. Unfortunately, no. Our first year, we uh, we had a really good uh, recruiting class that came in, right? Uh, and we went from the year before we were we finished eighth in the in the nation, mm-hmm. and then that year we finished third, and then the next three years, unfortunately, we lost in the finals. Made the finals, so. yeah. And then the year after you graduated, that's the that year was, after I graduated. That was the way okay, let's want. get rid of Johnson. Okay, but man, son, son, those sons, <laughs> sons of bitches. How you know? There, there, how there's, dare them. We, we we had some very dynamic, you know, and, and it's a team. It's a it's definitely a team sport, mm-hmm. um, team effort, and all that kind of stuff. I mean, the three, the previous, well, all all my four years, we really never had two legitimate middle blockers. You know, we had one guy that was maybe six five, and the other that was six two. Yeah, you know, just athletic, and, and undersized. Exactly. Right. And so when I left, um, Tom Duke, and then I think it was Brian Ivey that came in, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, USC. He came in as a he was a senior in ninety or ninety one. So Yeah, I think I think he came in as a freshman and won, yeah. if I'm not mistaken. I could be wrong. But you know, here you, yeah, I mean you have two solid middles and then you got Jen Kai Lu yep. who came in and took my spot, who apparently didn't lose a beat. Um, and so that, that right there is a pretty solid, pretty solid unit. So, yeah, man. uh, it's so good for rock them. stars, man. <laughs> yeah. Well, Ivy, the first college game I've ever seen was on the, the NCAA finals. It was on, 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 on big two, big CBS. Mm-hmm. Um, and they played Long Beach State. And the standouts were Brian Ivey. I think Tom Selleck's kid was on that team. Nick Becker, Dan Greenbaum. Mm-hmm. Um, and they played a very, very agile, goofy foot named Brent Hilliard. Uh, Long Beach right. State. Zach Small, Jason Stimpig. So that was that kind of generational thing. That was my very first college game. The first time I saw you play, Team Cup. <laughs> team <laughs> Cup Volleyball, man. In that, fact, was, that was fun. That was fun stuff. Let me Actually, let me show everybody what it looks like first. Um, show a couple of players. Actually, your, your team, Coca Cola. For everybody watching the video, he's they're the team in red. Yeah, I'm in the back on the right here. There's a little red set. Goodbye. Goodbye. Look at that here, dude. Dude, so, so for anyone who wants to know what the hell Team Cup volleyball is, um, Team Cup volleyball is basically the 10 foot line is like. The 15 foot line or 12 feet, right? Or 12. Yeah, I think they pushed it. I think it was 12 feet. Right. And one person from the back row was allowed to come up and block. Everybody could. Oh, that's right. You you could do a six man block. You could have six people blocking if you wanted. Uh, You just had to make sure that you stayed in the right rotation uh, for service. That was pretty much it. And then then remember remember who's in the front row, when and where, because there was plenty of times uh, when. you know, someone wasn't front row, but they were hitting front row. Oh, this is where Alan hit me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you were, look, you were a bomber. They were trying to figure out, like, if they had to give up something, you know, like, out of, like in system, 
right? Even with four blockers, it's like we got. Do we give this guy a line? But your wrist away was 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 ridiculous. You know, I mean, you made a you made a college career out of that too. You were a player of the year in 1986 uh, at USC. So. Um, but at least USC got it, got it done. Listen, I'm a Buffalo Bills fan, all right? Nobody knows about going to four four finals <laughs> in a row. <laughs> you know, I mean, you weren't there for that one, but at least, at well, least I was, they got I was, one. I actually, I actually was there for – they were losing to Dallas, right? Yeah. In, in those times because – Yeah, Giants, Washington, right, Dallas, Dallas. Those were in the, that was the early 90s or early mid-90s because I remember we always would go to the – the Super Bowl, the AVP players. So I think I saw two or three of those. Yeah. Oh, you you played in one, right? You played in one of the Super Bowls, uh, um, AVP, right? Uh. Who was it? No, it was um. No, 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 no. It was someone else. God, I, I'm trying to remember. No, they I had a, they had a match at the halftime show. Like. Oh yeah, yeah, match. no, no, no. That was at. Um, I thought that was at Dodger Stadium, though. No? Maybe I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, but yeah, we we went to I think two or three of them, so I remember all those. But for me, oh, like, look was. for the Bills, like if we were gonna win one, it was gonna be that right. first one. It was sure. gonna be that first one with the Giants. They lost twenty to nineteen. But Bill Belichick had this stupid idea, like in order for us to win, Thurman Thomas has to run for one hundred and fifty yards or more. And they thought he was crazy, but it turned out he was right. Thurman Thomas ran for one hundred and eighty-six yards, ran basically ran rush out on the Giants, but. Some, but Bill was right, and and num- the numbers said that they were going to win, and I was like, it's "All about wow. the numbers." Good lord, I was just oh, so bad. So, <laughs> rock star um, career at USC, of course. We're, I mean, the AVP is a whole a whole chapter we're going to talk about in this. But I think I'm going to go back a little bit further than that. Adam Adam Johnson, why volleyball? What the what what got you into? <laughs> What got you into, into volleyball? What what was it? Girls? Was it? Okay. Um, We're coaching juniors. You're right. <laughs> Jesus, so so uh, the volleyball club that I played for, Laguna Beach Volleyball Club, um, they they always had these clinics every Sunday, and you know my mom, you know she she kind of she kind of pushed me into it. There was a couple other um, parents that were were doing these with their kids, and my mom said, "Why don't you just go out and try?" Right. So I said, okay. So I went out and tried and, you know, you do it for six weeks and whatever. And then I, then I noticed that there were some females there as well. And, you know, I, I'm not going to lie. Uh, Laguna Beach high school, my, the four years I was there, we probably had the best looking female team in the country, you know, hands down. So, uh, you know, that, that was part of it, but I just enjoyed, I, I just really enjoyed the game because it was, for me, it was pretty tough to learn. And, you know, it's kind of like golf, like you, you can always, you're never going to get, you're never going to be perfect, right? But you can always try. Um, and so it, it was a little bit tougher for me to pick up and, and, and learn. So I think that's what really drew, drew, drew it to me uh, in, the, in, the, in the short term. Uh, and, then, and then once, you know, I just continued it, it, it was something that, you know, I just enjoyed doing and I played four four sports a, a, a year while I was in high school. What high school? And, what high school? Sorry. Laguna Beach High School. Oh, cool. Okay. And when you were talking about your 38-1 and one record, we were on a 69-0 and 0 record. Yeah, it was like two years uh, in a row, right, of just yeah, being undefeated. Yeah, yeah. And we finally lost, but we ended up winning CAF anyway, so that was kind of yeah. good that, you know, we got that monkey off our back. But um, So that's, that's really why. And I honestly didn't even know I was going to be playing college volleyball until March maybe of my senior year. That and I got my first letter, and they said, you know, I said, Dad, what is this? And they said, Well, they want you to come play at their school. They want to pay for your school and all this. I go, Okay. So I talked to my coach, and he's, you know, so I sent out some other, just one quick good story. Um, yeah, I, I actually tried to get out of California. You know, I sent out, I sent to Rutgers, Ohio State, Penn State. I heard back from Penn State and uh, um, uh, Tom Tate, right, who's the coach yeah. at the time. Uh, you know said, thank you, thank you, but, you know, we only give uh, scholarships to, you know, impact players. Good luck. And, and at the time, I'm like, I, I'm not I'm not like it is today, right? If it, if it was today, I'd be like, oh, psh, well, you know, screw you, and I'll see you, and I'll beat you down, and all that. You know, I just, I didn't, it didn't phase me. I was like, no. okay, like, I guess they don't want me, so that's cool. And so, I, I end, of course, long story short, I end up at, at SC. We end up playing them in the finals, I think. 
uh, or the semis of NCAAs, I think two out of the three years we beat him. And the first time, you know, he said, wow, I made a mistake. You know, <laughs> when I shook his hand under the net and I just go, oh, well, you know, it's not, yeah. you know, people make mistakes. I'm not like going, yeah, you did. No, did. no all's, well, yeah. all's well that ends okay. Yeah. I mean, no, it, it, was pro- it, yeah. it was probably a blessing in disguise. Yeah. So. Well, the, to me, and this is a time tested thing, east, east and west. When I look at West Coast colleges, uh, um, I look at talent. When I look at East Coast colleges, I look at coaches, who, who the coach is, you know, because you can have a, a D2 or a D3 coach with the right players that can beat any D1 team. Like Charlie Sullivan was doing some pretty good things at Springfield. Um, Rutgers was a very small men's program at the time. It was D1, but it was tiny D1. Um, I, I think I I think I met Sullivan in, in 2015. Was he coaching yeah. that team? Then? Yeah. So I was doing uh, – Lacrosse uh, player. <laughs> yeah, I was doing some color uh, over in uh, Russia for the World University Games. Yep. And his team – was representing the U.S. on the indoor side of things. Yeah, Springfield. Yep. Yeah, those guys yeah, were. They weren't. They weren't that good for that particular event. But no. But bang for you know. your buck, you know. Yeah. For what I mean, you, look, you, you, you can. No one else wanted to go, so he took it. He took the advantage. He took it. He said, "We'll go." Good for him, you know. And I yeah. mean, that season they took UCLA to five. They took Long Beach State to five. They, they, they before they played their D three schedule, they, you know, had a kind of iron sharpening iron thing. They took a West Coast trip. They finished zero right. three, but, but everybody knew who they were. So and, but to me, that's just an example. Like, um, like IPFW, good, you know, good coach. I think it was Lloyd Ball's dad, right? Yep. And, um, um. Rutgers had some just really good European players, though. Some Ehor well, um, was on that team. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there was another another uh, team I'm spacing on right now. They yeah. had, had a lot of European players. Yeah. And then Jason Olive in the 90s, he had Uvaldo Katz on that, that lefty. It just, yeah, just a, wow, wow, just a killer team. So your high school and how you got into volleyball said way to my, kind of like my next question. Um, I'm, I'm kind of an interview mode, trying not to be. We're just talking here, but was there a particular tournament or a match where you left the match or the tournament and said that actually this is what I want? This is what I want to do when I grow up. This is I think I could be really good at this on a real. So basically, yeah. when you knew this is going to be what you were going to do, was there a particular defining moment in club or high school? It, it, it's really hard to say because I almost, you know, I kind of look at it as I, I do when I play. I, I got to pass this next ball. That's all I got to do right here. And so, um, but like I told you earlier, you know, I didn't know until March that I was going to play in college. And then in college, you know, I, I didn't know that I was going to have the career that I had. I just played my hardest and did, did everything that I needed to do. I mean, I, did, you know, World University Games a couple times during my years. I did, you know, junior national team, uh, train with the national team during my time, but I still didn't say, ooh, I want to go play professional or I want to be a professional beach player or whatever. I said, you know, at that time, you know, uh, the national team was 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 my goal, you know, I, but after that, I, was, I had no idea what I wanted to do. So it wasn't like I I always knew what I wanted to do. I just took it, you know, one day at a time and did my best. Yeah. And if I made it, I made it. If I didn't, I I didn't. Yeah, no, I I feel you. Like, look, for me, it was after I graduated boot camp. You know, um, I was in the military and they had a military community team in Frankfurt, Germany. And, you know, I'm coming out of boot camp, best shape of my life. I learned how to play a little bit um, under the Creole guys, like the – Crayol, like at, at the time, actually, kind of like around your time, late 80s, a team of pretty much all Haitians and Dominican guys, East Coast guys um, that, you know, they played in the Caribbean games. Very, very, very good players. So I learned under them and I was like, wait a second, <laughs> everything, I, everything I hit, <laughs> even when I miss, I couldn't miss, you know, right. I'm left handed hitting left side. So, you know, it's easier on my shoulder. You know, you could do that all day. And right. I, I ended up playing um, professionally in Darmstadt. Um, Germany two years so yeah. so so for me it was it was after I, I joined boot camp I uh, I got set nine balls and I put nine balls away and I was like and the crowd was you know just 
it was just galvanizing and that rush of just everybody just just screaming, pretty screaming crazy. your name one guy actually le literally left the bench to get on the court and gave me a high five and went back went back to the bench you know and everybody just like all right leave it hey leave it alone we're a family here you know so but in germany right. in particular in the military community a lot of talent from um Isla samoa um, uh, a lot of but I was going to say, I, I've heard of a lot of military mm -hmm. groups, a lot of, yes. a lot of Samoans, a lot of Samoans playing, yeah. playing volleyball. So, uh, yeah. yeah, it's kind of interesting. You said that I was not, you know, yeah. thank you for your service. I wasn't aware that you had been in the military. I'm a, mm -hmm. I'm a huge military buff. I mean, I, I had a, a guy that I graduated with, uh, who was, uh, I don't know which SEAL team. He was a commander of one of the SEAL teams. Uh, another, another buddy of mine, uh, uh, flew uh, P3s. Yep. Uh, so you know, I, and I I would always watch that military channel. I mean, mm -hmm. I love I love that stuff. I tried while I was playing. I tried to get over to uh, you know uh, Iraq and 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 do some you know just cheer, cheering up the boys. Yeah, you know? some and USO stuff. I was, yeah. I was very I was very close to getting you know getting over there, but it, it never happened unfortunately. Right. Yeah, uh, well, James Barker, who we were talking about, that that yeah. talk about talk about someone who's about that life. <laughs> you oh, know? Yeah, no, yeah, yeah I, all about that. Well, me, I knew I was going to serve because um, every male member of my family served all the way, dating back to as far as I can really remember, honestly, uh, probably World War One. I. I had a, both grandfathers, World War II, Korean War, my father, Air Force. I got a kid sister, just to, uh, first female in our family, did two tours in Afghanistan. Um, I was a generator mechanic and I supported MI. I supported military intelligence. So when they had to go somewhere, I went with them, you know, me and a Humvee mechanic and anything right. broke down, we fixed it. And, you know, I brought the propane grill. He brought the Nintendo. We played some video, you know what I'm saying? We played some video games until something broke down. But, but man, Barker was a, Barker's about that life. He, he, he was, um, with the Blackhawk crew. <laughs> Dude was a Blackhawk, yeah. a Blackhawk operator. Yeah. <laughs> I've, I've, he's told yeah. me some good stories, so uh, yeah. it's pretty cool. He, he is cool. So we're going from the 80s to the 90s in your career. You win multiple tournaments. You win actually King of the Beach, which is one of the first tournaments I've seen you play probably after Mad. I don't know if that was before Madison Square Garden or after Madison Square Garden. You played a game. In uh, that was uh, after. That was after. I was at that. I was at that game, by the way. I, um, oh, I'm sorry. I was at that game, Madison, the Madison Square Garden okay. one. I was at that yeah. match. In fact, that was that was kind of interesting because yeah. the, the thing I remember the most about it was uh, the night before there was an event in, in Madison Square Garden. I can't remember what it was, mm -hmm. um, but they had all of our dirt or well, sand <laughs> outside, yeah. um, mm -hmm. and it had rain or got some. It had rain and they, it got wet a little bit, but then it froze because it was really cold. Mm -hmm. And when they brought it in, you know, we were playing on it and we found some little chunks of ice in it. <laughs> in fact, look, we got a video version of this. Okay, DJ, spin that stuff. Tournament with standard fare. Oh, that's, is that it? No. Is this the I think that's, the, yeah, that's probably the intro to it. I want to get to the last play, though. You, oh. It was a time clock and you, <clears throat> man, you murdered this ball. It was About the down the line one? Yes. All right here. It's all knotted up at nine. Let's see what Jose can do. That's a good serve, Here's by the Kawhi. way. It's Jose with the block. Blocked! And what a dig! Johnson with the block! Look at the crowd in Madison Square Garden, dude. That's like, dude, that's like a Knicks game crowd. Dude. That, right? That's, dude, that's a Rangers game right there. That's a Sh dude, that's a Chardé concert. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was packed. I don't know how many were in there, but it was, it, it was fun. It was it was electric in there. That's for sure. Yeah, that so that was the first time I saw you uh, play in person. I, actually, the only time I seen you play in person. Um, Mike Dodd was there. He was heavily involved in getting that to Madison Square Garden. Um, Chi DiMaggio, who was like a, a New Yorker, who was in, playing in um, mid level women's player. I think she she only fin the highest she finished in the AVP was fifth. That was the best she could do. But she was you know doing her thing and she was in New York. So, and it was great to see you. Uh, first time I saw Loyola. I've seen Karch a bunch of times. Um, I was actually in the at the Olympics in '92, so I got to meet a lot of um, 
the the eighty eight guys that Karch played with that that stayed okay. in the Memorial Olympics. Um, I was on an end around mission with the Italian Army. We I wanted there. to be there in ninety two. Yeah. yeah, we want. <laughs> you should have should have been there well, in eighty eight. They, they kicked me off the team. You know, I took a you know a lot of people don't know, but you know when I was on the national team in eighty eight and eighty nine, um, I got an offer in eighty nine to mm-hmm. go over and play uh, professionally over in Italy. Right. And, you know, I was struggling to make, make ends meet. I wasn't, you know, I'm not living large playing on the national team. I'm, I'm no. living paycheck to paycheck. And I was actually having to pay to play on the team. And there were some guys that were playing, you know, I was playing in front of that, you know, have gold medals. And they said, that's just the way it goes. And I said, well, okay, I, I got to make, I got to make a living. So I left and they said, well, if you leave, you are banned from ever playing on the national team. And I said, okay, I guess that's, I mean, I got to do what I got to do. So I, I did. And, um, I think it was a great decision. I'd heard, you know, like in Manhattan, I think it was in 93 or something or 94, you know, when Fred Stern was taken over, they said, well, you know, Marlon and Sunderland are like, well, you know, they can really use, you know, Adam on the national team and he's welcome back. And it's like, it's like no, no, one's not. <laughs> talk, no one's ever talked to me. First of all, no one's ever talked to me about it. Right. And, I, and I was bummed. Because I'm, I'm a huge, I mean, you know, every summer I, I dedicated my my summers to, you know, the World University Games or, or the junior national team. So, you know, I, I was into it, but, you know, things happen and, and I was a bad boy. But short, shortly after that, everybody was able to go over there. I got to tell you, well, you played in the Italian League in 1990. Did you play in 90? That was there. That, yeah, 90. Yeah, that, there was, let me tell you something. It's well, we all know it's like mob money, right? So basically it changes over like every 10 years. So that time period, the Italian league, and then in the 2000s, it was Russia. Russia had the, had the, the, the big money league and now, and now it's Italy again. So, so three decades, it just changes. The, I think the money just changes over right. when the gig is up, right? The money changes <laughs> over to like a different country or whatever. And this and yeah, that. I, so, I had a great time over there though. Yeah. Uh, I got married, I married, my, married my wife over there. So oh, it man. was... It was pretty awesome. Yeah, I, look, I was in Sardinia, a military operation with the the Italian army at the time, and, and we spent our last uh, seven days on the beach, just R and R. The the mission yeah. the mission got done early, you know what I'm saying? Us and the Italian army we were exchanging gloves, knives, you know, hats, boots. We were just just doing this exchange thing, and and that was '92. I I I um I got yanked off the volleyball team actually because they didn't have any generator mechanics for this mission. And I'm uh, like, I'm like, you got 200 and something soldiers and, 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 no, and no damn generator mechanic. So I got yanked off the team and I'm sitting on a hill full of yucca bushes with a guy who doesn't speak English. I don't speak Italian, but we both spoke, <laughs> but we both spoke Spanish. So that was, yeah. oh, that that, was well, and, and I did yeah. the same thing. We, we, uh, when I was on the national team, uh, we went to France and our interpreter that we had didn't speak English, <laughs> but she spoke Spanish and I, 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 I understood Spanish enough. I mean, I took it in college and stuff, so I was dialoguing with her in, in Spanish, mm. which I thought was kind of funny. So the second time I saw you play was the Goodwill Games. Um, that was 1998. That was in New York. Mm-hmm. And they had a Brazilian team. Um, what the Americans would call relative unknowns, but um, I mean, Brazil, New York has a huge immigration population, so I, I did know who they were. It was um, Rodrigo, um, uh, Para, and Guilherme, um, Marquez, Para and Guilherme. Yeah, 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 Guilherme and Marquez. And it was crazy, like, the shorter guy did was the full time blocker, and like, the taller guy was like the dig and trans hitter. And I saw them play Sinjin first. Like one game to fifteen, they won fifteen two. And I when when I saw that game, I said, Man, I hope AJ and Karchin are watching this match. <laughs> Man. How how good was that team? You ended up playing them twice. I think you played them somewhere in in the middle of the tournament, you played them at the end. Um I don't know. What the hell was so good about that team? It was, it, were they just no frills? or uh, I mean, I'm taking you back, and I'm sorry about that. That was a yeah, long no, time ago. I, I mean, I'm trying to remember it. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, I know we lost. Yeah. Um, but uh, I don't remember the score. Hopefully it wasn't 15-2. to two, But uh, No, no. Um, that was Sinjin, and, um, and I don't know who his partner was in the Goodwill Games. But Okay. I was like, um, You know, from what I can recall, I mean uh, – Para, who was doing the blocking, if I'm not mistaken, mm-hmm. uh, you know, he had a great jump. So, I mean, 
you know, I'm one of those guys that if you're, if you're small, like I've always been, I'm six, three, I've always been small. They've told me I've been small since I started playing. Okay. Whatever. Yeah. They're, um, they're ridiculous, you know, but go ahead. But if, it, but if you're not giving up points, you know, go for it. You know, I, I let, let my kids, I had a, I had a, on, on my 16 team two years ago, I had a girl that was five, two. She's bombing from outside. She, she played beach and she bombing and she blocked better than anybody on our team. So, you know, I, I let it go, but, uh, I think that they just, uh, you know, maybe we, we might've taken it a little easy or something. I, I don't remember. Mm -hmm. Um, they were good. Uh, I'm not, you know, I can't take away, can't take anything away from them. They were very athletic, made some great plays, um, caught us off guard. Um, yeah. And, and the, and the sand temperature was 110 degrees. It was, it yeah, was, it was New it was York hot, in the summer, you know, man. and, and yeah. of course, uh, that, that always plays a part, but it, it, you know, it's the same for both. You know, I remember Kent and I played down in Brazil at the, at the FIVB world championships and it was like 127 on the court. It was, I mean, <laughs> they, they sprinkled the court down and then you could just feel it, the water evaporate. You know, go up into your in your glasses. It's crazy. You're just, like, you know, you're like, you're just gotta, trying to like gotta take my, gotta take some my water. glasses off and defog them. You know, it, it was uh, that was crazy, <laughs> crazy hot. Oh man, so. I like what you said about your player. Um, there's two things I wanted to say about the whole height thing. One, everybody says this guy's undersized, that girl's undersized, this guy's unders undersized. But when it comes to the time to vote for like best player of the tournament, the best player in the world, best player uh, Olympics, best player of this, why it's always the guy who's six two or six three, right? In 2004, it's Jiba who's six two. I mean, for uh, and you know, in '88, I don't know if it was Karch, but if it wasn't, it should have been. Um, you multiple time, you know, um, um, pl uh, player of the year, or, or certainly, certainly at the top tier. You're one of the last teams left, and I, I find it ironic that when ever they're looking for the best player of the tournament, it's not the mythological beast. It's it's the guys who, I'm not, I'm not going to say average height, but, but slightly above average height. Like Bruno, well, Bruno Oscar Schmidt, graciously listed as six feet tall, right? Won, um, they won 2016. He was he was a tournament MVP. So, sorry. Guys. Yeah, well, I think I think from an in, indoor standpoint, at least, um, you know, the big guys usually are only playing half the game. The, right. the outside hitters or the liberos nowadays, mm -hmm. you know, and, uh, are playing, you know, all around. So I think that that, plays a, a pretty big role for, you know, players like myself mm -hmm. uh, to get recognized because we're out there a little bit longer than, than, they, than the big guys, if you will. Right. Uh, unless the big guy is just putting everything down and blocking everything, you know. Right. Like, you know, that's, do you, that's a different story. like you still follow AVP, right? Who, who would you say is the best player, in, uh, the best individual player in the AVP right now? It's probably, it's maybe still Phil, but, but yeah. maybe, but maybe Taylor Crabb. Who's 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 all around game? Um, actually, I think me personally, I think it's his brother. His brothers are more um, brings more tools to the tool, you know, brings more tools to the toolbox. But it's no, it wouldn't be a surprise if player got if Taylor got player of the year. And Taylor's not Taylor's not a giant, you know what I'm saying? Right. I, I don't um, even know how tall he is, yeah. but he's uh, he, he's he's a good player, yeah. that's for sure. Any one player of the year, and and for Long Beach State in 2013 again. The, outside, outside again, hitter, someone the normal that, guy. Some, yeah, outside hitter, somebody that played all around. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think that that's, I think that's, of course, more valuable than. I mean, it's uh, you, you're splitting hairs. I think you know because who's to say you know if the setter plays all around, you know, is, is he not the MVP? Right. You know? So I, I don't know. So for indoor, indoor, you're right. Like team comes into play. Everyone has a certain role or whatever, and and sure. and someone has to be voted all tournament team. Someone is eventually going to be MVP. I mean, you know, in 2008, I thought Clay Stanley did a really good job in the finals. You know, I thought Riley Salmon was fun, was fantastic against Serbia Montenegro. In fact, I don't think there is a semis and finals without him doing uh, those certain things. And um, I guess I'm going back to the whole club thing. I talked to a coach, Brian McDermott, Chicago, um, Chicago coach. He um, progression beach volleyball. He actually showed the Department of Health uh, the how safe playing indoor beaches, social distance, and this and that, and made national news. So I had him on the podcast, and he said the thing he despises when coaches line up a whole bunch of kids against the wall, 
and you know points at this kid you're too, you'll never do this you'll never do that you never do this and when he was talking about how how much it upset him i i, I share his sentiment i as a coach and i'm going to give you the floor in a minute because this is said way to ask him a question i as a coach i will never look at a kid and tell them they can't do something but i will look at the kid and say look you're five eight you're gonna probably gonna be five nine um, I'm not gonna lie to you. Outside hitters aren't aren't are not that are not that height at the competitive level. But if it's what you want to do, and if you want to put the work in, you could do this. Do this. I'm gonna give you my guy. You know who won the box jumping competition? Uh, of course, being the best passer on the court goes without saying because you can't. If you're undersized, it's because you're the you're a Riley Salmon. Um, so. I will ne never tell a kid they can't do something, but I will be realistic and say, this is what they're looking for. But if you do this, and if this is what you this is what you want, you have to be put in the unfair position where you have to do it, where you your finish line for the hundred meter dash is one hundred and fifty. You know, um, your thoughts, your sentiments on on how you approach some of these kids, and the floor is yours, um, AJ. Yeah, I. I I mean, you can probably just rewind what you said. Uh, I, I would never tell anybody that you're never going to be able to make it. Uh, I, I'd let them know, you know, what kind of battle they have ahead of them mm -hmm. um, and, and do the exact same thing and say, hey, this is what you need. This is what I believe you need to do. You need to do this, 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 and this um, and, and kind of go from there. And, you know, I'll be there for you. You, you let me know what you want to do. I'll, I'll you know, I'll guide you to the best of my ability. Um, and, and whatever happens, happens. You know, if you can look at yourself in the mirror and say you're giving 100% effort and, and it doesn't work, then, then it didn't work. But if you, you know, if, if, you, if you say, um, no, I'm not giving 100% effort, then, you know, right there, you're not, you're not giving yourself that opportunity. But I, I'm not one, <clears throat> I'm not a coach that's going to ever guarantee a scholarship to somebody. <laughs> in club you know I, i'll say i can give you the I, I can expose you i can give you the most exposure out of a lot of people or something to that extent and you've got to be the one that's gonna you know show up and, and and show them your stuff um you know those kind of things but yeah no i i mean that's just i i'm not that type of person because you never know i mean I, the thing if i ever if if I ever did, which I never would. But if I did, and that person came back to me years later and said, I did it, I, I would say, you are, that's awesome. Congratulations, you proved me wrong. You know, but I would never say that in the first place. So uh, that, that situation would never happen. No, that's, that's good to know. And that's, honestly, that's ex exactly the kind of coach I thought you were. And that's exactly, I mean, from the out, only from the outside looking in, I can only talk, I can only see what my, my eyes can see. That's kind of like what I thought <clears throat> you were, you were kind of doing down there in Austin, having a good time, you know, with, with other good coaches like that. I think Bobby Jones is uh, project served is, um, doing, um, I doing a really, I think it's so weird because I've never seen him as a coach. I've known that guy, Bobby Jones, for like 10 years when he was modeling, doing, you know, with the Lenny Kravitz afro and everything. And I, for me, I'm, I've always thought, and I'm not trying to disrespect him, but I always thought players that coach, that jump into coaching are never going to hurt your game. They're just levels of how much they can help. I mean, for the most part, they're not going to hurt your game. And I'm like, how much can Bobby help? What the, hell, what the hell is Bobby going to do that's going to help someone any more than someone, you know, who's who's been who's been in, in, you know, neck deep in coaching. And he just I just think people surprise. Right. People surprise you. You know, I'm very, very happy with the stuff, the, the work he's doing there in Texas. I'm very happy with the work you're doing in Texas. I'm very happy. James Barker guy drives two hours and 10 minutes a day uh, to get yeah, to get to get to practice. That is that's crazy. That's dude. But that's that's that Ranger up stuff, man. You know. Right. Um, well, and, and we had this mm -hmm. conversation because there's a place up there that he's looking at to, to hopefully get some people uh, mm -hmm. uh, to help him out with. You know, it's a it's a it's a, a, a beach. You know, I think it's like I think we measured out to where it could be five beach courts. You know, at this park, that's right. you know, the beach courts are totally run down. But he he wants to redo it and, and get it up. He said if he did that, then he'd probably move down there, which which would be smart. <laughs> You know, yeah, it's two hours there and back. I mean, that's 
that's yeah. a lot, you know. I mean, definitely got to be dedicated and, and all the above. So, yeah. uh, you know, I, I, I mean, I would do that if if I had an opportunity right now to go somewhere, you know, I don't know, maybe send it, maybe two hours is quite a bit. I mean, but but if you did it twice a week or something for a while, I, you know, and it was maybe you're looking at the long, the, 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 the big picture. Yeah. You know, you're looking at the next few years. If maybe you're going to move to that place. Yeah. I do that. It's also about what, what your state of mind and, and the time in your life is right. Like, look, I'm 50. All right. I'm going to be 51 this oh, month. You're old. Yeah, man. I know. I, I dude, uh, I, I read the Bible and reminisced, man. It was, it was, I'm, I'm just, I'm up there. Uh, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> I'm not, Good. I'm probably not going to drive two and a half hours for a volunteer assistant position in my in this point in my life. Sure. If, if I just moved here, you know, of course, I'm, I got to pay dues all over again. They don't care what I did in New York. Right. I kind of get that. And I knew even at 50, I knew they're going to make me pay dues all over again or whatever. But but I'm like, nah, LMU, John, that's 40 minutes away. I could do that. You know, sure. um, Irvine, Concordia, maybe not, you know. Jeff Alzina is a Santa especially, Clara. Especially with all that traffic, man. What, the hell, that traffic. Did, what the hell do these people do to or, or do? What the hell are they doing two o'clock in the afternoon? That that is jam packed like that. Where the hell are these people going two o'clock in the afternoon? And this I is mean, a New Yorker, in, Adam. Well, but even back in in the '90s when I was playing, if you know, I, I always played with somebody. A lot of the times up in L.A., Manhattan, or whatever, we we play there. If I didn't get on the road at five forty-five, yep to get there at 6.45, basically, no. and then go have breakfast. If I left at 6 o'clock, I wouldn't get there until like 8.30. I mean, it was just crazy. So I, I'm not one that likes, likes to sit in traffic no. at all. So I, well, I always left early. Well, Adam, Adam, New York is different because you, if I lived on 87th Street and I'm trying to get to the village, I get on the one train. I'm there in 17 minutes. Right. The, oh, they, yeah. the, the no, one train I, I, runs, I love, it runs every would, six minutes, dude. Yeah, I would love to do that. You know, if I lived in a situation where, yeah. you know, you could do public transportation like that, and it's, it's pretty pretty yeah. easy. I mean, you know, when we went to Japan and, and places like that, we, we took their, their, their stuff all over, all, all the time. You know, it's fun. Yeah. It's, boom. There you go. You're there. You're there, yeah. you know, wherever you're going and uh, makes it a lot easier. <laughs> Let me tell you something cool. In New York, if you own a car and you live on the Upper West Side, there's something called alternate side of the street parking, meaning the street sweepers have to come through. So what everyone does, they all, all the cars that are parked in that lane uh, where, where the street sweepers come, they all pull into the middle of the street. And everyone sits there. They, they have their coffee. They're reading the newspaper. The street sweeper goes by and like synchronous swimmers, they all park at the same time. There's always someone who tries to swoop in and take your spot. And then, you know, sure. then, we're, then we're ready to oh, throw down. I can you know? only imagine. Like, hey, hey, ass, you know, hey, asshole, you know. That's, yeah, that's not going <laughs> to go down. That's not going to go down. Um, that would be, yeah, that would be fun. Cool. I know we we only uh, I don't know how much time you have left a little bit of time, but I do want to um you. I got all the time in the world. Oh man, that's good to know because there's there's a very very important thing I wanted to talk to you about that's to you and me is just conversation, but it might be worth listening to someone else. When you play beach volleyball, all right, all these these accolades. I actually watched highlights of like your King of the Beach run or whatever. I also saw uh, a AJ highlight film. You know, uh, Karch Karch took a six pack, and two plays later, he's on your team. He's bowing. I mean, just just it's just. I feel like when I watch those games, I feel like I'm there. The, the crowd is intimate. They're emotionally invested. You, you you as players and as personalities back then took them. Um, were willing to take them on the journey with you. You know what I'm saying? It's like, hey, come on, hop on this train. You know, there's more than enough room. And when you lost at the end, they felt for you. When you won at the end, they celebrated with you. And it was this boom period of volleyball. Now that's just on the emotional level, all right? Now, on the money level, I was looking at bvb.info, right? And and I noticed there were two big boom periods. It was like 90, or at least as far as you were concerned, uh, just the start of your career. I only I only looked at yours. I can go back and look at everybody right. else's. I'm not, I'm not going to do that. Early to mid '90s, pretty much 2000, and then dead, and then like 2008, 2009, 
another big boom period. When I say, and when I say boom period, I'm looking at six figures, just salaries disclosed, not not undisclosed, not sponsors, not um you know winning the Pottstown Rumble or Mother Load or or Wapaka or whatever. But um, what the hell happened? <laughs> what the hell happened? <laughs> There's, you know, there's, I think there's just a lot of stuff that happened. Um, you know, I, I, I've got my, I've got my theories and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, I can tell you what I think and, and people might go, oh, you, you don't know what you're talking about, you know, kind of thing. Um, well, that's why it's but, called the option. You know, <laughs> this, even, this even, well, this even came up, you know, uh, on Facebook old school, uh, you know, Ken's putting, putting out these articles, which are pretty cool. And I think Sam Lugano, you know, he came out and said, you know, we used to be able to say, you know, the AVP, you know, we're, we're, we are the best tour in the world. We have the best athletes, the best players in the world, which we did. And then there, therefore we had the, the, you know, the money to go, to go with it. Um, I think once we went to the Olympics and the FIBB then said, here's how you, as the United States or all countries are going to qualify and you have to come play on our tour. Now, in my opinion, this is just my opinion. Uh, and, and like I said, there's other stuff, you know, bankruptcies and all that kind of mumbo jumbo people running the show and all that. But I think that helped FIVB become the number one tour in the world because now you have the best players from every country playing on their tour. So they became, I always use this analogy, they became the PGA and we became the European PGA. And I don't know if you watch golf, I do. but when I watch the European PGA, I don't, I, I rarely see people on the watching, like right. at, at the, you know, it's, it's not, that's not my point being is if I'm a sponsor, you know, I, I want to, I want to sponsor the best tour or the best athletes or whatever in the world. And so I, I just think that was a part of it. I, I think that, and this is hard to say, right? Because we didn't have the money, we didn't have the camaraderie, but if we had all stayed together and said, no, we're not going to the Olympics, we're gonna keep this lifestyle that we have, this whatever lifestyle, you know, the TNA, the, 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 the beers, the party, the atmosphere, and, and just build that brand and stay here, it, it could, it, you know, we'll never know, but I think that it could have helped. Yeah. But you're always going to have you're always going to have a couple of strays who are going to go you know behind and go represent the United States. Now, are they going to be the best U.S. players? I don't know. But you know, it, it all it all comes down to money. Uh, it, and at the time, we didn't have you know things weren't going that way, and so um, you know, hence the AVP tour now. I mean, we have three events this year, three events last year. I mean, you know, I, I've got a, a, a pretty good group of uh, open level players here in, in Texas uh, that, that go to the qualifiers and they try and qualify and, and stuff like that, uh, that I train. And, and they're like, this is a joke. You know, you know, we, we, we want to get after it. What, what can we do? You know, there's, and, and everybody comes up with their own ideas and all this kind of stuff. And it, it's, it's sad. It's really sad. You know, in my opinion, it's really sad now. I can look at it and say, well, I hit it at the perfect time. Uh, I'm reaping, I, re I reap the benefits from then. I'm reaping what, what's happening with girls volleyball now. So I, I'm okay with it, you know, and I can say that, but, you know, deep down I'm sad. I, I'd love to see these guys make double, triple more than, than what we make. You know, that I, I'm that kind of guy. Me too. You know, I know that there were some, there were some, there were some players that, um, when I first came on the tour, I was kind of a nobody. And then I made the first three live telecast, uh, tournaments, you know, finals on NBC. And I went from, you know, nobody to, Oh, you're that guy with the hair, you know, and eventually everybody kind of figured out who I, but there was a lot of animosity with some of the other players that have been there for a while that have been, you know, 10, 15 years. And I went from, you know, in, in, in a year and a half, I went to that exact level they're at from a marketing or not from a, you know, from a, a, a visual standpoint, I guess, right. or, or a marketability standpoint. And like to, like in today's athletes, um, the social media stuff, it's crazy and, and, and more power to them. You know, I think I, I love the McKibben brothers, you know, I love watching this stuff. I'm actually going to get to play with one of them, uh, 
uh, this this weekend, uh, Madison uh, yeah. at the charity charity spike. Madison. Uh, there's cool, going to be some other AVP players yeah. coming out here. Uh, uh, Urango's going to come out. Uh, Baranek probably right. Yeah, with, he's with Gina coming out. Uh, uh, yeah, there's there's a couple others. So you know, it's it's going to be fun, and, and and I enjoy talking to those guys, and I, I believe they enjoy talking to me. Uh, we were out in, a, in last October in Hermosa doing a four man tournament. And that was fun. It was great to be back yeah. out there. Well, you said so, all the right names too. Like when I think of Madison McKibben, um, when I moved here, I was writing the beat the, uh, or beat reporting for a volleyball one on one for Andor July, the UCLA guy in the 90s. And he was the one that gave me my first interview because I was trying to do like a sports, like a Tuesday after the AVP. I called it um, Volleyball the Tuesday After. And the, the, the guy, the very first person that gave me, that stepped up and gave me like the interview was him. It was him, Betsy Flint, and, and the McCullochs, Kevin and Allie. Um, and John Mayer I knew from Mexico, but that's a whole, that's a whole, a, a whole other story. He's a repeat, a repeat guest, repeat offender. But the, th the cool thing about Madison, the, like some people are nice because they know it's good for their brand or their, or their star power to be nice. And, and on a general level, you, don't, you never know who you're talking to. But with him, it's very, very organic. It's real, you know? And I mean, I don't like using the word phony for some people because phony, um, there, there are levels of of realness and phoniness like you can be polite and not, not like somebody right i mean sure. you know like new york this is this is what they say about new yorkers <laughs> right new york some, I, you, I, sure some you're gonna like say about new, new, new yorkers we don't like you we're not gonna pretend to like you we're not gonna be an idiot about it but you know but but at the same time you know we're not gonna go through the false dichotomy uh, as if you know you're my best friend in open arms so but madison his politeness um is authentic it's organic, and and I like him for it. And, and Eric Baranek, since since we're, we we just said Baranek and Gina, I could say the exact same thing about them. I met Eric five years ago when he was trying to get it in, and now you know he made a semifinals in Manhattan Beach. He's still the same Eric. And and yeah. and those and the reason why I brought him up is because they're good for the sport. Um, Amazon well, Prime, and, and, and like and Amazon Prime, good, is good for the sport. And, and I've had some good conversations with him to the point where. You know, um, and, and it's kind of sad, you know, nowadays, with, of course, with social media, um, there was, uh, I, I think Eric, Eric put on a, you know, one, one of the social platforms, him hitting a jump serve. And, of course, I saw that he foot faulted, right? And, he, and, and so I said, foot fault, you know, just, just a comment. And he goes, oh, come on, we need some, you know, and we need some positive <laughs> words of wisdom from you adam you know da, 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 whatever it was and i and i wanted to say something at the time and i can say it now probably because it's, yeah. it's kind of fun i guess and it's a joke okay mm -hmm. eric it's a joke yeah but he, you know give me some words of wisdom and he had just buzzed his hair i don't know if you remember that <laughs> he, he cut that thing short and i was gonna say i was i was going to say you should have left the dude right <laughs> and and and, and and I think it's funny and I can tell him and he can see this and I'm telling yeah. him it's funny. But if I put that down there, he might not take it like yeah. that. Right? Or, because or, we, or even know, not him, other people reading it, right? It, it, exactly. Yeah. And I'm just, it's happened. I don't want to say it's happened a lot because I, I don't do a lot of, you know, comebacks. And, and when I do, I make sure that, you know, put enough emojis on there or whatever to, to let people know that I'm joking. But mm -hmm. You know, sometimes it doesn't, it doesn't happen that way, but no. yeah, you know, but those but those guys are good. I, I you know, and, and it's it's fun that uh, someone is actually making a you know help helping make a living, you know, for for what he's doing. I, I think that's I think that's very cool. You know, I do. I wish yeah. that we had that kind of stuff back then. Absolutely. Yeah. Am I he and am I upset with them because they have it and we don't? No. 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 <laughs> you know, come on. That's, that's just that's part of life, and that's you know. Yeah, That's well, him and Troy are, should be like a human sponsor machine, man. I mean, honestly, with their personality, like they should be a year from now, they should be coming to the court in NASCAR suits, <laughs> you know, just full of full of freaking sponsors. Anyone looking for a good proctologist might want to check Troy's left leg, you know. Just, I mean, they personality-wise, I think they do have a following. I do think people would be interested oh, in watching absolutely. them and this and that and. I, um, me, like when I first moved here, the way I got to know people, I just, I bought a camera, 
I pointed out the game, then I started talking about talking about volleyball, breaking down the analytical. People agree with me, people disagree with me, but it eventually got me work. You know, Casey right. Jennings liked what he saw. I, he put me off of P1440. Pepperdine, I did all their home games, you know, and eventually people found that I was a coach. So I ended up coaching against Eric three times in Manhattan Beach, um, twice, twice in a qualifier. And then once in the main draw, I was Rafu, Rafu Rodriguez, Ed, Rat, Ed Ratledge's partner. I was his analytics oh, yeah. coach. And he's like, all right, enough. See, I don't want to see you anymore. <laughs> so so from the contenders bracket all the way to the semifinals, man, that's, uh, uh, you know, a, a place where he grew up and he just had stars in his eyes where he've always wanted to play, man. You, you couldn't have found someone more happier for him than me, except for maybe Gino Urango and Bill, right. who was his partner, man. I was so, you know, and just like I was talking about you, the way you guys were would invite people to take the journey with you. He did that. He's out there, he's high five in the crowd. And, and then when you win the crowd, it's like, almost like a, like you, you watch the gladiator movies or whatever, you win yeah. the crowd. That's, that's, that's the beginning of the beginning, man. Well, well it's you interesting know? because sometimes, you know, like uh, this one time when I was playing with Jose, we were playing um, Rob Hydra and Troy Tanner in the finals of uh, uh, the Jose Cuervo tournament mm -hmm. uh, in 96. And we had just had this dropout, just fight, groveling, clawing, scratching game against uh, uh, Karch and Ken. I think I think we beat him by two. I don't know if it was 13-11 or 14-12 or 15-13, but we won. And, and before and we're in the tent, and, you know, uh, uh, Troy and Rob get to sit around and watch us just, you know, sweating our tails off. And, you know, I, both of us were just dead. We were dead. And, and I and I looked over at Jose. I said, "Dude, I'm I'm hurting." He goes, "I'm hurting too." I go, "We got to come out and, and do something, right? Right off the bat." Long story short, I mean, we beat him 15 to zero in the finals. Okay, you can go back and look at that one. First time ever. I mean, you know, you're talking 100 grand for the winner and 22 22 five for the losers. Yeah. And and it, it was it was it was an awesome match for us. But we weren't, the crowd wasn't behind us because we were destroying this team. You know, I mean, they were, but they weren't, you know what I mean? Yeah. Not like maybe in Manhattan or something like that. No, so yeah. It, 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 it is weird. And, you know, um, but, but uh, you know, the crowds are awesome. And, you know, I always stayed after and signed autographs yeah. and, and, and those kind of things. And, you also had a look, too, that was inviting and friendly. You know, like some people look at Karch, it's like, okay, he, he's, he's, he, you know, his match is coming up. I don't want to talk to him. When the match is over, he looks like he just wants to go home. I don't want to talk to him. You know? <laughs> he always looks like he got his face always looks like he got something to do. Same thing I, yeah. I could say about Phil. And for those introverted personalities, I think that they're they're important for the sport too. those guys that just let their play do the talking. Um, and those players have to be the best in the game for for them to. To, to, to thrive or whatever. Well, a lot of people, a lot of people, a lot of people don't know this about me, but you know, growing up, I was very, I'm a very shy person, right? And so sometimes when you're shy, it comes across as being an a hole, right? And you know, because oh. you're just kind of, you know, yep. you're doing your thing. And, and um, I think that a lot of people during the time I played, at least the players, felt that way because one, and I'm just a little different. I go, I'm not here to be your friend. No, you know, I mean. When I, it was funny because we had, uh, I, I wore those foot digs when, when I got Nike and they, they first came out. And I remember the first tournament where the sand was really hot. I had like three or four guys come up to me and say, hey, you got an extra pair of those. And I go, yeah, 1500 bucks. <laughs> you know, and they're like, well, what do you mean? I go, why would I give you, <laughs> you no. know, why would I give you anything? You know, no, you're, you're, my give you an advantage. you're my competition, <laughs> you know, I mean. So it, 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 it's kind of interesting that way, but, uh, but I'm, I'm still, you know, everybody says how, you know, the people that I know, of course, they go, you're not shy. Look at you. You're out here talking and, uh, yeah, because I've known you forever or whatever. So, right. So it's a pecking order. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Me and me, I, I think I was the other way around. Like I was always, the, I was a shy kid until I was 10 and then you couldn't shut me up since, um, uh, very extroverted in indoor sixes, and I have a smile. I can't. I can't help it. I have a smile that looks like a smirk. So, mm -hmm. so I I came off as like a a hill because I'm like this on the court. You know, I get a block and I'm like this, and they're like, this dude really thinks he's that good. He really, and you know what? And but at least for me, 
I ate it up, you know, and we lived in a time period where we had teammates that had our back. Like if there's a little trash talk on, on, on the net or if I'm arguing with a ref and, and maybe I cost a little bom, bit of momentum. Uh, and this is something I learned as a coach and as, and as, as a player later. Uh, do I have a team, the next player that's going to get aced because of this? Right? right. And, then, and then I blame them like, oh, y'all supposed to be backing me up. You know, and really, it's my fault because I could have just, just let, let it go and just went over. Or do I have a team where it's giving Popeye spinach? So, you know, I mean, when I first started coaching, I was like every other per coach. I was an, a good X's and O's guy. I can show you how to penetrate a defense. I'm, I was a career setter. I'm also, you know, left-handed too. So I was a pain in the ass in the front, front row. But as far as like moods, understanding moods and understanding uh, men, you know, performance through leadership, women performance through uh, com camaraderie. Um, and just like some teams like you play brazil maybe they're fired up if you talk shit, and maybe you don't want oh, yeah. to you know and I, I it's crazy i've been playing the game 30 years and year year 19 I, I, somewhere year 19 and year 20 i'm like wait there's an easier way to do this well it's kind of the, you, know, you, you mentioned you mentioned you mentioned brazil and, and, yeah. and that thing i remember this one time when you know i was just on the national team it was the 88 mm -hmm. and we were playing brazil and at the time, I, you know, these guys, they're doing these warm up hits. These guys, these Brazilian guys are hitting like warm up twos under the net, yeah. right? Back under the net. I've never seen that before. And, and I was like, I'm like, wow. You know, like, whoa. You know, and, and, and Karch comes up to me and just goes, just watch, just watch. And, and you know, I didn't play, I watched, um, but they, they went out and smoked them because their ball control is just, yeah, our ball control is way better than theirs. Yeah, you know, at the time, at the time, so two passer uh, system, man. It was yeah. Stavert League was voted best passer in the Olympics because yeah. no one no, served because no one served Karch because <laughs> Karch right. is better. <laughs> yeah, and he had to be good. I mean, yeah. you, trust me. I, I you know I remember having to get to practice and practice from eight to twelve. You know, five days a week, and the outside hitters had to get there, or some of us outside hitters had to get there at seven. Right. And just be, you know, served that for an hour before practicing the start. So and, you know, I get that. And even back then, serve was king. Like I watched 88 uh, USA Brazil semifinals for during the, the medal run, which I think was the best indoor team ever assembled, in my opinion. Uh, um, the U.S. men. You beat the Soviet Union. You beat, you beat the, the comp compilation of all those countries three to one. Right. You're, you're, you're the kings. So but Brazil. They got to the semifinals, jump serving people off the court. They were one of the people. They were one of the teams where they had four guys, four guys on the court and two guys on the bench. That that if they got hot on the jump serve, um, wh whatever. But when they played the United States, they had eighteen service errors, and the United States had one. So the United States had five aces, one error, and Brazil had one ace, eighteen service errors, and and even for side out. You know, you kind of you, you get a good play, then you serve the next ball out. You kind of cut off your own momentum. So, I think I guess what I'm trying to say is, we were talking about what great passes Karan Severtlik is. Sometimes, when you have a good team passing like that, some people feel like they have to serve more competitively, and that's when they start missing. And that's where I thought the 18 misses came from. I thought the 18 misses came from the constant pressure of Karch and Severtlik making it look easy. You know, which well, is it's the same. You, know, you can say that with any skill, like. Uh, you know, I love defense. Mm -hmm. You know, that's mm -hmm. that's uh, I love defense. Yep. So if I can keep the ball up off our side, it's just going to frustrate the other team. Yeah. You know, it's the same thing. You know, if you're blocking, um, mm -hmm. if they can't get it past you, it's going to frustrate them to where they're going to have to change their game, do things out of their comfort zone, yeah, uh, to try and change the momentum, which usually goes the other the other direction. You were you were look, you were the king of the one move. Like, um, I was John Mayer's assistant at LMU, right? And we have these focus-based practices. So, like, for example, if you're passing, you got to go into the into the drill with a focus. Your, your passing focus is straight and simple or holds your platform, you know, uh, or um, one move to the ball. But, but your one move on the shot um, was really, really good. <laughs> I teach it. I, the, the, your first step, your first step. The bigness of the first step that allow that gives you instant speed that gives you permission to slow down as opposed to you see some players right they step small then the second step they, they look like they're still in the same place it looks like they're doing a running man like the dance um you're you're, you're like the king of the one move i i teach that 
I, I teach that because I watch videos of you. Um, John Mayer, um, by the way, also is a very good guy uh, as far as one move, um, one move to the ball. You know, there's so many ath elite athletes that even at the high level, I see them making like two moves and sometimes they get it. But how many points are they giving up? Not just staying balanced and, 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 and one move. So okay, sorry. Yeah, I call, I call it the matrix base. You know, I'm sure you remember the uh, yes. Matrix when he's getting shot at, you know. And, Just watches and, the and, bullet go by. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so, of course, I, I tell the people, I say, you know, I go, why does that happen? And I go, yeah, I know it's it's special effects. It's a movie and all that. But, you know, he's got his he's got a base. He's able to keep his body, you know, in, in, in tune with where he needs to be. Whereas if you have your feet in front of each other, you're on a, you're, you know, you're, you're on a balance beam and if it goes one way then you're off balance so uh you know that, that's that's a huge that's a huge thing that i've done for many years uh and i try and teach that to uh the guys that i'm working with now mm -hmm. um and, and it's hard you know because they're you know some of these guys are 20 you know 22 to 35 that are trying to play on the you know the qualifiers and stuff and it's hard to change bad habits um but you know i'm trying and yeah. if, they, if they want to listen, it, you know, it, it'll help them out. But guys, well. listening at home, people listening at home, that was a big court. <laughs> this, guy, this is a big court. Yeah. I, I mean, maybe they, to to search, maybe they need to Google search. Maybe they need to Google search what big court means. Because I, I, I tell so many younger guys, oh, he played on the big court. And they go like this kind of. I'm like. We had a, we, we had, uh, I think it was a couple months ago. Uh, we had our first annual Adam Johnson old school tournament. And we had, uh, I think we had 12 teams, if I'm not mistaken. You know, it was only it was a small place, two courts. Uh, but it, it was funny to hear, you know, everybody's like, first of all, wow, this court's huge. You know, we, didn't, we played with no antennas, so it was a little bit free, you know, like, the, you know, like 88, 89, whatever. But, uh, but a lot of them were huffing and puffing, you know, after a, a pretty long rally. And they're like, we didn't even score that point. You know, we did, it was just a side out. And, and, and couple of the games lasted a lot longer. They're like, I don't know how you did this. And, you know, everybody talks about, well, you know, you know, oh, you old school guys think you're so good compared to the new guys and, and all that. And, you know, you can't compare the two games because the two, I think, pretty completely different games, uh, except for the skill, of course. But, uh, you know, it's a fast paced game nowadays. And we played a, a slower pace, you know, long, long haul game kind of thing so could could the players today play old school rules of course they could they some, to adjust to some it. of them could. Big, it's not it's not that we were better athletes and all that kind of stuff and we were in better shape we were in better shape for that game mm -hmm. yeah you, i mean if you if you take some of the guys that are playing now and put them in a tournament with old school rules they're probably going to die because they're not they're not used to it that's all it's just bad it's just getting in shape so do i think that they could do it absolutely just like we could adjust and, and did uh, from the old school rules to the new rules. I remain impressed, like as decades go and like certain rules change, of course, the big boom of rule changes happened in 2001 for indoor and outdoor, but we'll just talk about outdoor for now, right? New ball, the yellow and white ball, um, short court um, and let serve and, and block uh, block now counts as one of the hits. So all of those. It, it all always the, did. It did in the nineties. Oh, it did. Okay. Oh, I, yeah. st uh, I stand corrected. I played a lot of grass too. So forgive me. Grass, grass block did not count as a hit for the big court. You know, I used to play in those tournaments and Sherwood. I played in the Pottstown rumble a couple of times. Um, yeah, but but a lot of like, like a lot of rule changes that happened in two thousand and one, like indoor the, the introduction of the libero, a let serve rule was allowed, um, double hit. Um, was illegal as first contact, though carry wasn't. I, I really wish some of the referees knew the difference between what was what's you know caught and thrown and what's a double. You know, what I mean that. But that's, uh, that's and, why and, I tried and, not to talk about indoor. <laughs> well, when they when they always change, and you know, I can talk more about. <laughs> I'll give you a perfect example. Um, you know, in junior volleyball, at least out here, you're not always getting people that played volleyball, right? So I give you an example. This. This one, this one referee, you know, made a, a terrible call. And, and I, of course, argued it and all this kind of stuff. And afterwards, I talked to her, and I, I was nice. And I was like, hey, listen, I'm just trying to help you out. You're gonna, I'm kind of nice. I'm pretty nice. You're going to get crushed yeah. if you do stuff like this. 
And then she, she eventually goes, yeah, you know, I, I probably should have called a jump ball on that. And I was like, oh. yeah, I go, it's not, it's not basketball. I go, were you a basketball referee? Oh yeah. I was, I was a basketball referee, <laughs> you know? And so, you know, but I asked when, when they, when they had that one net play or net, you know, rule where if you're blocking, but you're not in the play and you net, it's incidental contact. And, and I said, okay. So I, first of all, I asked, I don't know, three or four different referees, their interpretation. And I got four different answers. They, yeah. So those are the kind of, those are the kind of things that, that irritate and they irritate anybody. I mean, I was irritated. So I said, so if I go up to block on the outside on the, on my right side, and the setter sets it back, and I come down and break the net. So it's bouncing up and down, and then the, the got their right side hits it into the net or it hits it on the top of the tape. You're trying to tell me that's not that doesn't affect the play? No, it doesn't because it's on the other side of the court. Yeah. I'm like, what? That's ridiculous. So, some no, of those, but some it's of like rules. yeah, and for indoor it sucks because they're messing with your blocking lanes too, or you're blocking momentum. Like I don't care if someone didn't mean to touch the net. Who who the hell in the play touches the net on purpose anyway? Uh, I mean, uh, and I didn't. And thank God they did away with that bottom of the net thing. That lasted about a year, and and the yeah. powers that be got rid of that because I don't think that you should have your pl best player taken out for three months just for the sake of getting a point. It's like, we got good news and bad news, uh, Adam. The good news is you got the call, <laughs> right? Uh, hey, but the bad news is uh, your, your guy landed on top of him because he's blocking second and you know. doing doing everything right and probably not going to see him for the next <laughs> the next two or three months. <laughs> I didn't, I don't, like, come on. I mean, I, I yeah, they have to. And I think your complaint was let all the referees have a meeting and not have four different interpretations. Uh, it, they, and that that has to be, you know, I mean, you know, when it comes to the rules changing for the beach, mm -hmm. you, you know, I, personally, and, and it's not because I played on the big court or whatever. I just think that uh, I personally like to see the guys play on a big court. They can keep the ball. Yeah. They can keep the they can keep the scoring. Ball's you know, easier on your shoulder, thing. man. I like the, I like that ball better. This try to jump serve on a wet day. Try to serve a top flight when you know that's when, when the rain just stopped. You know, like, the mm -hmm. ball that we played with, you know, if if I'm just using this as an example, if Please. I hit it 50 miles an hour, mm -hmm. the new ball I can hit it 60, 65 miles an hour. That thing had some. I mean, I can show you. I don't know if I could do this, but I can show you uh, when I came back into. I stopped playing after the 2000 season. I came back in, in 2005. Yeah. And I got rocked by, I don't, I can't remember who it was, uh, but I've got it on my phone and, and I show everybody because I, it's, it's funny, but that ball is traveling so much faster. And of course my partner was supposed to be taking an angle, but he didn't. Uh, and so I wasn't really ready for it. And I, I just got, I mean, I got throttled square, you know, square in the face ball went over the net. Mm -hmm. I, but I have I, I had bad eyes at the time, and uh, I do have new lenses. That's why I'm not wearing glasses anymore. But uh, um, my my lenses popped out, and all I had were my frames. And oh. so I put my you know I put my glasses back on to kind of play with the crowd. Like okay, I can see now. I don't have any, <laughs> I don't have any lenses, in it. and then that hit hit me in the chest because I couldn't see it, and I just fell over like I died because I got hit twice in one play. Give me um. Give me an example of a of a bizarre uh, yellow card you've gotten as a coach. We a we bizarre. could we could revisit a, the player thing, which would probably be more interesting. A bizarre of yellow card. Um, it's just something where like I don't know where where you, maybe you thought you deserved it, but you know or not or just or a reason they a reasoning they 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 give you a yellow card, well, which was I, bizarre. I don't I don't know if I could actually. I mean this 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 happened. There was a play where there's this uh, one referee. This is at. Uh, at the uh, Lone Star Classic, big tournament, right? It's a, it's a qualifier and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And, and this guy uh, coaches at, a, at another program, the referee coaches at another program, and they're actually his program, the team, he's, it's not his team, but it's a team from his program that he's, he's refing. And I'm like, this, first of all, this is not fair. You know, yeah. there's, a, there's definitely a conflict of interest. Anyways, so he, he's making, He's making terrible calls against us, not calling against them, 
those kind of things. And it just so happened that we had the, the tournament directors, uh, table or whatever was, was right on the other side of our court. After he made a bad call, I walked up right before they were, the other team was about to serve. I walked right across the court, you know, almost during play. I mean, he could have blown the whistle. I went up and, you know, they, and then he blew the whistle and, and I went up to the, to the, to the tournament desk and said, someone's got to get out of here. This is a joke. Mm-hmm. It's a complete joke. Yeah. And so they had somebody come out and sit and watch and he didn't make another bad call. <laughs> That's just how it was. Right? Oh my God. Um, come but on. Yeah, I mean, so, you know, those kind of things, I, I don't know. I, I've never gotten a red card. Um, I've gotten some yellow cards, but it's because we can't even talk to the referees anymore. So yeah, you can't say you know, boo always, on Halloween. Yeah. Yeah. I always have to get my, and, and this is the funny part because my girls are so nice. They won't say, what I want them to say to the referee, right? So if they, if, if someone, you know, butchers a set, you know, I, I talk to my, I bring my captain over, I go, you gotta, this is exactly what you have to say. You gotta say, can you please tell me what was good about that set? You know? Oh and, dear, and she, that's a trap and go question back, for a go go over there and go, they'll look at me like this, like, uh uh-huh. But that's a trap I'm question still, for yeah, the ref. Say it. Of course not. It's a trap question for the ref. <laughs> you know. But, but my girls are too nice, and I'm like, you know, that, you know, I tell them to say funny things, you know, that are that they of course won't say. Yeah, I'll give you a nothing, cute. Not, nothing, nothing bad. Nothing bad. I'll give you a cute one. We um. I was assisting my, one of my close friends at John Jay, very small, uh, at that time, hemorrhaging program for the men. And we're playing a pretty good team, uh, Baruch, a, t- a, t- a, t- a program that I helped build. And there's this guy that's taking like 13 seconds to serve. All right. Uh, um, you know how the, some of these guys with the jump serve, they have to bounce, 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 hold it in front of them, stare at the ball for like another five seconds and eventually high toss and then serve. So... I started whispering, counting the seconds in my head, and then my team started doing it, and then the side of the gym, uh, but it was like a loud whisper. No one was screaming, one, they were going, everyone in the gym was like, one, but it was loud enough to two, where everybody could hear it. <laughs> three, four. We get we got to twelve seconds, and finally a ref gave me gave my entire team a yellow card, and um. And I said, what's the yellow card for? And he's like, misconduct. And I, and I got so mad. I said, why don't you draw a joker on that card and put it back in your back pocket? That's misconduct. <laughs> and everybody, everyone, and, and, I'm, and it's crazy because I'm an assistant coach, but I'm thinking like a head coach. You know assistant coaches ain't supposed to talk. So I was already in the wrong, you know, because I'm, I'm doing my boy a favor, but I'm not, you know. I just got so upset that this guy gave me a card for him not doing his job, for him not enforcing the rule. The rule is eight seconds. Adam, you know, eight seconds, which you can grant nine or 10 eyewitness accounts, <laughs> the entire half, half the gym, by the way, it was an away game. They just, uh, half the gym just enjoyed doing it. It wasn't even like a home game. So, right. so that was a bizarre, a bizarre yellow card I got. And I also got another one, Mario Trebich, who's a longtime referee. He's the head coach of the Netherlands, but he's this old Russian guy. And I met him and um, he was one of my mentors. I came up to him and I said, I want you to give me a yellow card and i'm gonna wave my hand like this and point my finger so this way my team can see that i'm standing up for them i'm not saying anything bad to you right now but it looked like you know from a distance it looked like i was given i was giving it to him i said i'm just gonna point my finger at you so this way it doesn't look like you're alienating me in front of my team so i need you to give me the yellow card and do what you got to do okay can you do that you know, so yellow card. So it was one of those things where everybody was like, you know, I was the head coach at City College then and they, everyone was clapping or whatever. But right. so that was another uh, an example of a bizarre yellow card. Red cards. I don't get them as a coach. I got plenty as a player, though. You know, yeah. you get in this one as a player. Uh, probably. I, I don't remember. If you you know, don't remember. I, 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 do, probably... I do remember. I, I do remember Scott Akatubi that I played with. He uh, he. uh Got two red cards to end our match against Karch and Kent. No, which I, was not, I was not match happy point about in game. Most of it. Yeah, <laughs> no. yeah, you know, and I was like, he, you know, Jim Leonard made a bad call, and and he said a few things to him, and uh, he gave him a red card, and wow. then turned so away. Another and one, came yes. Back to him and gave him another red card. <laughs> wow, that was that like was the game match. over. I'm like, no, that's cool. You're messing with my money, <laughs> Scott. Yeah. No, you know, yeah, yeah. I mean. 
you know, what are you going to do? I mean, well, Dane, it, it Dane, I had Dane Blanton on the podcast, right? And he told an interesting one about the semifinals against Portugal. Um, you know, side out rules, right? It took like close to an hour to get to 10 10. So Fenoy hits the ball who's, wide. Who's he playing with, and who's he playing? He's against? playing with Fenoy. It's uh, it was the gold medal run. So it was semifinals oh, against okay. against Portugal. So right. 10 10, Fenoy hits a ball wide. They call timeout. The referee, um, I guess, accuses them of taking too long get, getting back on the court. The referee skips the yellow, gives them a red. So now, um, man, they're kind of losing their mind a little bit. So because now it's 12 10 instead of 11 10. And really cool story because I thought it was I thought you sh they should at least get warned. Some referee, I mean, you have to be an arbitrary prick to to like skip the yellow and go to red. You, it, it's normally a yellow. That's just that was a, to me. I thought that was an abuse of their discretion. But the the intriguing thing was instead of having them that having that finish them off, it actually fired them up. They got the side out. Right. Dane got an ace. And then got an ace out of position four. Fono got a block. Then he got a poke dig off a jumbo, you know, trans out, and then an ace to finish the game. So the last five points were a minute and 40 seconds. <laughs> it took like an hour for the first, like, to combine 22 points to have. And Dane, you know, a very interesting story by Dane. But that was an. Uh, and yeah. I, hope, I hope those guys, I don't know what they did, but I hope they went up to the referee and shook his hand and said, thank you. He did. I, I he told me that. <laughs> He told you know? me that. He says, he says, dude, we probably would. You know how Dane talks. He talks like a surfer, dude. We probably wouldn't have won. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know. He said, well, I owe him thanks. You know, Portugal should be mad at them. <laughs> well, that's, I mean, you know, I, I was not a trash talker whatsoever. Right. Um, uh, you know, one quick story. When <clears throat> we were playing UCLA uh, my sophomore year, uh, in the finals of the regionals, and the winner goes to the final four. Right. Um, NPSF champ, right? Is that how it worked? He was an NPF at that time. It, okay. Whatever it was, I can't remember. But oh, yeah, okay. uh, the top team already gets to go, and then we have our regional tournament to see the second team, and then they have the Midwest and the East Coast. Right. Anyways, we're playing UCLA, and again, I won't say who it is, but uh, he played on the. He ended up playing on the. Uh, he transferred from Hawaii to UCLA to get a to get a ring, right? And so we were, uh, I get set one-on-one -on -one outside and he, this guy stuffs me straight down one-on-one. -on -one. So they go up, they go up 13, 12, and he starts just going off under the net at me. Like I, I was so shocked. Honestly, I could, I don't even know what to say. I was just sitting there and he's going, Oh, Johnson. Oh, we got you. Yeah. I mean, there's things I can't, I don't want to say, of course. And Not he right. just, he was going off and off and off. And I, I, I was just like, I don't even know how to respond. So I'm just going to go back and get ready to pass the next ball, which I did. We end up winning that set 15, 13 after being down 12, 13. And then the next two, seven and seven, you know, 15, seven, 15, seven. And I, all I did was look at him breaking right under the net afterwards, just breaking. Oh. And that just, oh, isn't it a great feeling? It just ate him alive. Yeah. You know, and, and I love doing that kind of stuff. I mean, yeah. Because I well, to me, the thing that as a former player, the thing that would hurt the worst is that you have to put up with the, the nonsense and you lose. You you tell yourself somewhere in the middle, look, I, 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 maybe it's an away game. Or like you said, maybe it's a maybe it's an agitator or maybe it's a maybe it's a combination. Of all these things, the refs, you know, a couple of plays go their way where the ref could go another way. Uh, they're playing out of their minds. Your, your, your team's having a flat game and all of these things. You're like, I, you know what? I can forgive all of this nonsense. Let me just, just give me the win. Just give me the win. And, and, and the, and that says paragraphs, <laughs> right? That says, well, I, uh, that I says paragraphs. That, you know, for me, me personally, mm -hmm. the, the guys that try and get in your head with that, that, that chirping and everything, mm -hmm. if you, you know, if you don't react to it, I, I look at it as, as if they're looking at a mirror. And it come, it's coming right back at him because they're saying, well, you know, I'm um, yeah. doing all this stuff and he's not even flinching. Yeah. Don't so now he's starting to think and then gets in his head. And at least that's the way I look at it. No, so you don't, don't feed the, it. don't feed the trolls. You know, I mean, the new generation calls it, you know, don't, don't answer the trolls. You know, I yeah. mean, I, I'm sure you, we were talking about social network and like some, some, some people like I've been doing color commentary for the last few years and I've been calling some matches and I, I I'll make, well, for me, in my mind, I always think I make a ton of mistakes because we're all, we're all our own worst critic. But 
but there, I make some mistakes and people just are just pounce on me. And what I, you know what I do? You know what I say? Absolutely nothing. I don't, you know, I'm glad I got the attention. I'm glad that someone wants to use this one small thing as a straw man fallacy, you know, to, to, to try to make this thing that represents me as a whole it doesn't you know i'm just right. so but but i guess you know there's no internet back then but that's 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 troll feeding you don't want to give them no no don't give them any more food sooner or later someone like that will have his own team turn against them you know in some instances your own team turns in it and and you just look across the net and you do nothing to unite that team <laughs> you do <laughs> nothing to take their diff to, to, to make them put their differences aside <laughs> and say we got to beat adam today <laughs> so Oh man. So Adam, let, let's get out of here. What, um, where can people find you to know more about the, the, um, the AJA and, and just, what you can, you're, and just you what can you're always go on, you can always go to our website, you know, www.adamjohnsonvolleyballacademy.com. Mm -hmm. Uh, you can go on uh, the same Facebook page. Um, and I think our Instagram is, uh, Adam Johnson VB Academy. Nice. Uh, so, uh, those, those are some easy ways to get to it. And, and you know, Google, <laughs> don't yeah. look at the first one. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> Look, the, but the most popular one was the guy who took Pelosi's, um, I mean, just a big old picture yeah. or whatever. And it, it's so weird because there were a lot of violent people that day. But of all the people that I thought that might have just in the middle of being, I mean, I'm not a Democrat or a he, Republican. He just right. looked like he thought it'd be a cool thing to do. Yeah, he, just, just having, he looked like he was just having a good time. Yeah. <laughs> Viva Las Vegas. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, that's, it was pretty interesting. But yeah, I, I, I forgot that, you know, until you brought that up. <laughs> that was uh that was his name <laughs> adam johnson all right so for uh adam johnson might love you for everybody at home but i can't stand you all right in fact i'm out of here so for all of you at home for all of you on your ipads or iphones for all of you on your desktop who runs the world old school old school for all of you on your droid for adam johnson this is episode 95 this is the option podcast stay with me i'm gonna hit my music uh but for now thank you all for listening we're out of here and come check out the option podcast on optiondb.com it's also available on itunes and spotify and on youtube under the ny varsity sports handle you're gonna love what you hear